everybody. We were happy to hear that many of you have already checked out our sponsor, Flipped. And some of you have even decided to use the application in your courses with your students. Flipped is the classroom attendance and engagement tool used by over 2,000 instructors across America. Flipped captures attendance, eliminates phone distractions, and boosts student engagement in a really clever way. This fall term, some instructors have already reported higher midterm grades, increased attendance, and reduction in attrition. If you are interested in learning more, Psych Sessions listeners will receive 30% off the regular price for a first semester trial when they sign up through the link www.flippedapp.co backslash psych. That's F-L-I-P-D A-P-P dot C-O backslash psych. Thanks. Hello, and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 73, where Garth and I had the opportunity to interview Dana Dunn from Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now, before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. So Dana Dunn and I have been friends for, I'm going to say, at least 20 years. Although I, I've known him for 20 years, but maybe the friendship has really developed in the past 10 to 15 years. And so if you know Dana or you know of Dana, he is an imposing figure in many ways. Uh, his academic prowess, his reputation in the field, his influence uh, is is unparalleled in many ways. And, um, and, and so I, I can just clearly remember, um, going to a conference or actually I can remember talking to Regan Gurung once at the AP reading going, Hey, that's Dana Dunn over there. I, I really would like to go over and talk to him. And, um, over time, as I got to know Dana, uh, he is a completely wonderful person. You know, uh, he'll cringe if he ever listens to this, uh, me calling him a big teddy bear, but he's adorable. He's warm. He's loving. Um, but you might not detect that from uh, a first conversation or, or reading some of his work, but he really is an incredible, warm and loving human being. Um, so it's, so the interview is really quite fascinating on a number of different levels. Um, you know, like most psych sessions interviews, it's a mix of both personal and professional. So we start off talking about, about his contributions to the field, the, the organizations within psychology that he's led, such as Division Two and Division 22. Um, so, so it's that type of... Um, conversation. We talk about his entry point in Division II, which was the Psychology Partnerships Project in 1999. This is his entry point for Dana, and he talks about his uh, work with Division 22 Rehabilitative Psychology. Um, talks a little bit about his upbringing. He talks about his origin story. Um, the two influential uh, high school teachers. Uh, he goes into some detail about, which I really found poignant and, and, and I appreciate it a lot. Uh, he and Garth uh, shared their background for one act plays. Uh, when I asked Dana about, so what instrument did you play in the band? He scoffed at me appropriately uh, and talked about how he played golf as a child and he uh, was not in the band. Um, he went to Carnegie Mellon University as undergraduate and spoke um, appreciatively about the skills, especially the writing skills that he started to hone while he was there. Um, He's the department chair at Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He talked about what he teaches there. Um, I loved how he talked about uh, he is no longer a completist. And I'm going to let him describe in his own words what that means and wh how he came to make that decision in his teaching philosophy. Um, 
I really appreciated, as he talked about, his writing style and process, because uh, as you'll hear me say in the inter- interview, and I meant this with all sincerity as I say it again now, my two favorite writers are Dana Dunn and Susan Nolan. And I don't mean my two favorite writers in psychology. I mean my two favorite writers of all time. When I read their work, I'm just amazed, and I I read it for pleasure. I read it um, appreciatively. And so um, I wanted to ask him about writing. He talked about some of his writing processes and some of his writing exercises, which I really appreciated. I tried to um, lure him into the writing process of uh, 140 characters in Twitter. He would not take the bait. We finally talked, we finally ended the uh, conversation talking about his new assignment and his new editorial challenge. I'll let you listen for that. And finally, an interesting twist on um, giving back and what it means to give back. And Dana had, as usual, a very interesting perspective on, he thought it has to be pure. In other words, giving back is only giving back when the person giving doesn't get anything out of it. And of course, I tried to gently and respectfully disagree with him about that. And so I think we ended on an interesting note that, I hope someday that we will pick up again on a part two. So I hope you thoroughly enjoy uh, this interview as much as I did. Welcome to the Psych Sessions podcast. We are in Washington, D.C. for the Introductory Psychology Initiative. Uh, This is an initiative that APA has supported. And uh, Eric is here with me. And we are with... Dana S. Dunn. (laughs) What's the S, Dana? Scott. Scott, family name. And so uh, in the business, in the podcast business, this is called a get. (laughs) We finally got someone we've been trying to get on the podcast for quite a while. That's true. One of the early names on the list, actually. Dana, thank you so much for taking time this Uh, afternoon to talk with us. Thank you for having me. And so uh, Dana is truly one of the legends in our STP world, the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. And so we've taken a little bit of lunchtime, a little bit of work time, uh, to chat this afternoon. So thank you very much. My so pleasure. let's talk about some of Dana's credentials. Um, well, we're going to need a two-hour uh, <laughs> uh, span of time if we're going to give that its proper due. Yeah. Uh, so like, let's let's get, get some highlights in case if, for people who don't know Dana. And I, I'm thinking that you're going to be the person to to do this, Eric. Uh, we, should we do this chronological or reverse chronological? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're going to do this. Let's see. Let's try reverse chronological. You've just you are serving as um, a president of Division Twenty Two. Uh, incoming. Incoming president, which is rehabilitative psych- Re- rehabilitation psychology. Rehabilitation psychology. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. You are a past president, president and president elect. You. I'm doing this truly reverse chronological of Division Two Society for Teaching of Psychology. You're on the. Board of BEA right now? I am. Oh, I forgot about you are past president of the Eastern Psychological Association. Mm -hmm. I I don't have my pelt order in the exact (laughs) order that they they are posted on the board. What else am I missing, my friend? Um... Well, I was honored by uh, the American Psychological Foundation with the Charles Brewer Award. That's correct. Uh, And I've been honored recently, or I will be honored recently, um, by the Committee on Disability Issues and Psychology here at uh, APA for um, distinguished contributions uh, to uh, disability and rehabilitation. When does that get uh, Uh, presented? That'll be be in Chicago at APA. Uh, It was a complete surprise. And uh, my friends here in the Education Directorate and on the the CABE Committee, the Committee on uh, Associate and Baccalaureate baccalaureate Education nominated me. uh, And I tried to dissuade them, but they did it anyway. (laughs) Well, I think we can jump back in, but I have a question because I heard your talk at EPA this year. Which I thought was wonderful. Oh, the the presidential you. address, I believe it was. That's yeah. right. Um, and uh, the talk was on disability. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember uh, ableism, mm-hmm. uh, that you talked about that a lot. I don't have um, <clears throat> a background, so that was a lot of that was new to me. Uh, some of it common sense, but some of it not at all. Um, how did you get into this area? Well, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a story. I'll try to be brief. Um, when I arrived at 
the undergraduate institution where I, I work, Moravian College in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was coming from a doctoral program, and I am a social psychologist by training, and I was trying to figure out what kind of research I could do. And at the University of Virginia, where I got my doctorate, um, I could recruit hundreds and hundreds of undergraduates to be in my studies. But when I arrived at Moravian, then our enrollment was about 1,200 students total. And my class sizes were very small. And to do one of the studies I could do at Virginia in a few weeks, it would probably take me a year or two to do one. And that just wasn't feasible. So I started looking around and thinking about what can I do to sort of keep my hand in. And, you know, two things occurred to me. I did a lot of stuff on um, the scholarship of teaching and learning, as we call it now. We didn't then. And uh, then I also started working with a couple colleagues that were doing what I would call sort of health-related stuff. And lo and behold, uh, I discovered there was a rehabilitation hospital in Allentown called Good Shepherd Rehabilitation. And they had a group of people who had had amputations, and there was a golf league for them. Most of these people either had – most of them were men, but some women. I mean most amputees are men, fewer women, and it tends to be from car accidents and industrial accidents, although it can also be congenital, of course. But anyway, uh, the, really an interesting group of people, and I was you know, um, at that point thinking about sort of the interface between social and health psychology and also wanted to do something that focused on resilience. And so anyway, I basically did a survey with this group of people. And in the course of trying to write up an article, I discovered this whole area uh, on the social psychology of disability that was housed within rehabilitation psychology that had been essentially ignored for, I don't know, uh, 30 or 40 years by mainstream social psychology. And I thought it was very rich and interesting. And I started writing in it. And then the people in rehabilitation psychology reached out to me. And then the rest is history. I mean, I've... I've tried to do – I've tried to maintain two streams of work, one in Division Two or related to Division Two on uh, on teaching and learning, and then I try to do something on disability every year. So, so while we're at that slice of your career, it just struck me to ask you, what did you do your dissertation on? Oh. <laughs> uh, I was fascinated when I arrived at Virginia with Ellen Langer's work on the illusion of control. and. Okay. My mentor, Tim Wilson, um, was doing a lot of stuff on introspection and attitude behavior consistency, and I worked with him on that. But I wanted to have, carve out my own niche, of course, and there was a lot of Kahneman and Tversky-like stuff in the air. And so what we were trying to figure out is when is it that people will exert illusory control and when won't they? And Langer had pointed out several instances where – they do and don't or shouldn't, and we tried to add to that. And it wasn't exactly a blinding insight, but um, when, when the as we as we put it, when the stakes are high, when you have something at stake, whether it's money or or something else, suddenly you become more rational. But if you don't, then you're going to take um, fun risks, or probably among some adults, bad risks, uh, because you think that you know accidents aren't going to happen to you. Uh, but anyway, so that's what the – so the dissertation was actually a variation on a gambling paradigm. That's And I never, I, I never went back to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to, but then again I mentioned why, why I didn't because of the sample size problem. There's but, still time. Uh, no, I've moved on. <laughs> I lost interest and moved on, which I always think is a good sign. But anyway. Yeah. So uh, Division 22, that's the other division right. that you're mm -hmm. uh, a part of, soon to be president of. Mm -hmm. um, when I heard your talk, I was just – it's interesting knowing you in the STP world because uh, then you don't, you don't get to know Division 22, Dana, very, very well. I mean, I guess maybe over dinners or whatever. But um, what I heard was a real – it was more than research. It seemed social justice oriented. Very much so. Um, how? And one of the questions that I was thinking about was how – at what point did that move from research into a justice issue? Well, uh, I guess there's two ways to answer that. Um, the theoretical way, which is somewhat honest, and, and probably the practical way. Um, I have a confession to make. I haven't collected data in sort of a, a rehabilitation way. In I think my last published study where we actually had participants uh, take part in an experiment was – 
God, it's probably been 2010, something like that, maybe a little after that. Um, and so much of what I write is more theoretical or, or it's more in the vein of social justice, uh, taking other people's data or, or, or other insights and trying to put them together in a package to, to, make a, to send a message. So, for instance, um, Kathleen Bogert, who is a colleague who teaches at Oregon State University in Corvallis, she and I are editing a, currently a special issue of the Journal of Social Issues. And for those of you who don't know the Journal of Social Issues, uh, it's sort of applied social psychology with a mission to improve uh, the world. And every issue of that journal is a special issue. And we are doing only the third issue on disability or ableism in this case in, gee, in the journal's history. And the journal was published back, I think it started in the 1940s maybe. Mm. So we have an issue on, on ableism coming out. And ableism is essentially the everyday prejudice and stereotyping that individuals with disabilities experience. So that can be what we think of as true prejudice. Um, I make fun of you because you have a disability uh, and I'm cruel. Or it can be um, what we might call un unknowing uh, ableism, where uh, I stare at you because you have a disability and I'm curious, but I don't realize I'm being rude and making you uncomfortable. Or I ask you because I see that you have a disability, can you, get, can, can you fix that? Can that be medically improved? So, which to some people doesn't sound negative, but imagine that you were perfectly content with your life as it was, and people were always coming up to tell you that you should change yourself. Right. I, you know, and there's so many topics I want to talk about, and I, I, I want to spend as much time as you want on this one, but I just want to point out one kind of related comment, which is it's, it's remarkable to be able to have a career that spans into two disciplines and be able to do well and become accomplished in two very divergent disciplines, it's unheard of to become a leader in two separate well, I don't, disciplines. I, I, okay, all right, all right, my friend. <laughs> all right, just wait a second. It, it's unheard of to become a leader, much less the president of two separate divisions. It, it's, it's not like you are president of the clinical division and the counseling division. Those are pretty clearly allied disciplines. I'm trying to give you a compliment. <laughs> this is a pretty impressive accomplishment to be the president of Division Two and the president of Division 22. There are people spend their whole lifetime making the accomplishment to do one of those. Well, but I have an explanation for why this is. Oh, or you could have just taken the compliment. Well, I'm going to we take could, the compliment. We could, we I, will accept, I will accept the compliment. But the explanation is uh, I'm a Lewinian. Uh, I believe in the person-environment relation. And I happen to pick two really good environments. It's more the people... In the environment. That should satisfy you, Eric. That is not pass that's not luck. It's choosing his environment. I realized I realized very quickly when and and I, for the let the record show that Division Two embraced me before I embraced it. And what does that mean exactly? I attended um, P three in at JMU in God, I can't remember what year that was. It was uh, the 1999, I believe. Somewhere around but there. I'm pretty sure you had to apply to that. I they did. Didn't, they didn't pluck you. I did, but I had I had always seen things about Division Two, but I just right. was, uh, I don't know, too lazy or too clueless to get involved. So I went and uh, got in with a very nice group of people and made a lot of friends very quickly and then never looked back. And, and so... You know, I, I had published in TOP before then, which is how I think I got invited. But um, uh, but you would say P3 was your your entrance into... That was my gateway drug. Yep. Yeah. So, and yours too, right? Or no? No. Well, I had published in uh, TOP okay. in 1988. I, I actually got a journal article in with Charles Brewer. Yeah. Um. In a related vein, do you remember when you met Jane Hallinan? Yes, I met her at P3. Was that at P3? Yeah, it was at P3. Yeah, I knew her before. I met Randy Smith at P3. Yeah. I met uh, Bill Hill at P3, Barney Bynes, Dave Johnson, Neil Lutsky, yeah. 
Um, uh, Ted Bosak, um, lots of other people. Yeah. Maureen yeah. McCarthy. Yeah. What is it like to go through that n- that list of names of people? Because every one of them yeah. has contributed so much. But I well, and that's true. Uh, but they're just friends to me. Not that they're not wonderfully talented people, but I think of them as friends first. And yeah. I always think one of the great things about Division Two, and this is true of Division Twenty Two, is. And I mean no disrespect to other divisions, but there are just nice, open-minded people who celebrate the work. And that's, I think, probably a fairly rare thing. Right. And we're also not trying to be um, – well, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to go there. But Sure. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to go where you w- were maybe going to go. And this could really be an edit point. So not only do you get to edit, but we can edit some. Oh, I don't ever want to hear this. Things. <laughs> so, so I, I'm so I have this hypothesis, which it really isn't important. That I think that Division Two folks, maybe because we're teachers, that we must be among the friendliest people in our own tribe. I oftentimes wonder, are teachers of biology, teachers of chemistry, as generous and loving and caring as teachers of psychology, which really kind of doesn't matter. It's a hypothesis that's really not all that interesting. I'm just a curiosity. And you, you almost went to the place that I thought you might go where I was going, because you were talking about the generosity and caring of the folks that you know in Division 22. And here's where I'm going to ask, and this might need to be edited. Do you think that might be because many of the people in Division 22 study prejudice and discrimination so much that they will go out of their way not to exhibit prejudice and discrimination amongst the members of Division 22? Are well, they... I think that's a, I think that's a certainly true in general. Okay. But I also think there is a... Uh, there is a certain camaraderie and appreciation for the work of many individuals, whether those individuals are scholars or practitioners or, in the case of my friends in, um, who, are, uh, who, who have been elected officers or committee heads in the discipline, right. there's just a, a sense of... Um, Working really, really hard, uh, and there, uh, I don't have a good explanation for this, but there really aren't any people who need to have their egos stroked all the time. Now that yeah. that it doesn't, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen right. because people thank each other and also acknowledge right. great work. But it isn't. I mean, there's a sense looking at other places in our field where it's a. Uh, Winner takes all mentality, and that just doesn't exist in either of these divisions. Yeah, or at I, least in, in my experience, yeah. or 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 to a very low level. Let's let's say that. Right. Who who was telling us? It's an early podcast uh, episode. It was Ken Keith, I think, who was saying that when he got to Division Two, or maybe it was Barney. I can't remember. Uh, when he got to Division Two, they realized that when you give a talk. Uh, people aren't trying to pick you apart afterwards, which was the experience coming from wherever they came from, some other division. And I can't remember who that was. I'm going to use that as a segue to go to to where did you come from? So uh, we often have our guests tell origin stories about where they came from. Mm -hmm. And so as much as you're willing to share uh, as you were growing up, um, was it in your household, mom and dad, was it going to be a question of, uh, are you going to college, or was it a question of which college will you go to? Did your mom and dad go to college? My parents both went to college but did not complete their degrees. Okay. Um, in my father's case, World uh, World War II intervened. Um, and in my mother's case, um, she met my father – he was 10 years older than she was, fell in love and left after her freshman year of college at the University of Miami in Florida. My father went to Washington and Jefferson College and um, could only, I think he was there a year or two. Uh, but so, but it was always understood that my older brother and I would go to college and of course he did and then I came along and uh, it was just where was I going to go? 
And how how much older is your older brother? Uh, my brother is dead. Um, oh, he's okay. fourteen years old. He was fourteen, he was 14 years 14 older than me, okay. and right. com- we were completely different. It's almost like a different generation. Right. Right. right, right. So, um, you know, my first memory, my first real memory of him, um, which I probably is false, but uh, <laughs> I know I remember the day he left for uh, for college because yeah. he was just gone. Um, how how old were you when he passed away? Uh, he passed away Labor Day 2014. Okay, so I so was that, uh, yeah. 54 okay. or something like that. So, um, but I knew I, I knew I was going to college, and I went to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and I went there quite by accident. Um, my closest friend had done a summer architecture program there. And the fall of our senior year, he was going back to look at CMU a second time, even though he knew he was going to go there if he got in. And I tagged along thinking, you know, I'll look at the humanities college. And I went to the humanities session, and I did not know that CMU had a world-class psychology department, but I found out that day. Had you had psychology in high school? I did. I had, I had a psychology class my senior year. Um, taught by my one of my handful of most favorite teachers ever, Jane Grote, who I've heard is still alive. I'd love to see her. Um, but she taught a psychology class, and the book was awful. It wasn't her fault. Um, <laughs> Do you remember the book's author? I don't remember the book's oh. author. I remember it was thin, and you know, about half of it was <laughs> bad, bad interpretations of Freud with you know vague clinical meanderings, and the second half was mostly sort of social psychology. Um, and that was the part that obviously captured my interest, although I do have an interest in Freud, but I really love the social psychology. So um, so I decided to go to, and I'm one of those people that, that for good or ill, um, once I make a decision, I tend to stick with it. And so I decided I was going to be a psych major when and, I was a senior in high and school. And I know I keep interrupting you, but I don't want to skip over high school too quickly. Sure. Were you a band geek? No, certainly you... not. No, oh, no. So certainly not. <laughs> certainly not. What, I can't I can't play an instrument. I can... What What did you do in high school? Did you, uh, were you I in did, plays? Oh, were I, you did, I did. Sports? I did. No. I did. I did um, theater and you did. newspaper. I was. I was like the... Were you the editor in no, the school newspaper? I don't think I was the editor. I think I was the features editor. I it's easy remember. to say this afterwards, but I would have guessed theater and newspaper probably yeah, at some yeah. point. I did. I did music musicals and one act plays and yeah. What do you have a favorite role that you remember from high school? <laughs> a favorite role? Yeah. That well, you there played. weren't that many because it went by so quickly. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, we did. We did. Uh, like guys and dolls. No, we and... did Bye Bye Birdie. Actually. Oh, I so. did Bye Bye Birdie. Oh, really? Yeah, I was Who? Nathan Detroit. Oh, uh, that's uh, that's guys. That's, that's guys we did and dolls. Bye Bye Birdie. I was somebody else. Were that's you, guys and you, dolls. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was Harvey Johnson, which is a small part, but in, I can't it, remember it, who he, I was. He has a role in the Telephone Hour, which is the sort of opening piece after the. Uh, you know the beginning. Oh my god! But um, okay, yeah. Okay. So you know, but yeah. Okay. All right. So tell but us. So, so yes. So there was a rousing yes to theater, but the thought of being in the band. Well, because I, see, I couldn't play an instrument. So, no, no, so no, no. There's so no, there, no, no, no. It was only, only poo pooed because. Um, it's okay. No, there's a story there because when I was in elementary school, when you know one learns to play an instrument, usually, um, I had decided for no good reason, that I wanted to play the French horn. And so... That's what I played, well, the French horn. So I came home and told my parents at dinner that, you know, that musical instruments had been introduced and that I had decided that of all the instruments that I wanted to learn, learn to play the French horn. And my mother said, you know, uh, we'll make a pact with you. Um, why don't you focus on mathematics more? And when you do really well in math, then you can play the French horn. And uh, you can guess where that went. <laughs> so I never learned. I, and I also think that my brother, my older brother, I can't remember what instrument he was probably, he was probably compelled to play something, whether he wanted to. Well, I mean, you have to understand something. Because, because my parents were so much older when I came along. My father was 50. My mother was 40 when she had me. Um, and they'd already raised a son who was, you know, he, he, so he would have been 14 when I you know, showed up. Um, they were exhausted because my brother had to do everything. He did everything from 
probably musical instrument to ballroom dancing to golf wow to i mean you know uh i don't think he was in the scouts or anything like that but i grew up in the 60s and at that point you know f- for some kids those were popular activities for other kids you know they weren't and so when my parents well mostly my mom when my mother would say, do you want to be in the Scouts? I'd say, no. And she'd say, great. Well, she didn't say, great. I think she probably said it to herself. Uh, and so the, uh, there were only a handful of things I was, uh, I'm going to use the word compelled, but really I mean forced to do, one of which was golf, uh, because my family played golf. Um, anyway. Do you uh, still play golf? Oh, no, I hate day? golf. Oh. I, I, uh, I learned to curse on the golf course and, in fact, quit golfing when I was probably – 12, 13, because okay. I just marched off one day after I had once again ended up in the rough and it just wasn't working. So, no, I hate it. I have I have two things. Go one is, the character's name is Hugo. That's the character. <laughs> oh, yeah, Hugo. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's the second love interest. Yeah, yeah, always. Um, and then the the other thing was, tell us about Mrs. Grote. That was her name? Grote? Jane. Yeah, Jane, Jane Grote. Grote. Yeah. Uh, what was it about her in this psychology course? What did you, or, or maybe maybe you could tell us about some of your favorite, your memorable teachers, either either. Well, I had I had a bunch of them, but, but Jane Grote and Margaret Emelson were the most memorable. And in fact, um, I just dedicated the second edition of the book I've done, the psycho the psychology major's companion with Jane Hallinan, into the memory of Margaret Emelson. Mrs. Emelson um, taught. Th- she taught theater. She taught um, a humanities course I took. Um, she taught speech. And um, she was just a fascinating person. So in one, she was this wonderful intellectual um, who loved various philosophers, including Schopenhauer. And then she could curse like a truck driver in the next breath. Uh, and she just had a joy of life. And I can't explain it, but... She's one of those rare people who brought out the best in her students. So, uh, and she's the if she's the teacher you would go back to see if you ever went back, and she's the one who would never forget your name, uh, no matter how many years it had been. So we reconnected several years ago on Facebook, and uh, I still would never call her Margaret. Um, that's her first name. Yep, I um, understand that. And. I saw her last October in Baltimore at one of my friends uh, – my friend had a photography retrospective. And she came. Uh, and despite the fact we hadn't seen each other for 30-some-odd years, uh, it was wonderful. And then – and I'm glad she came and I'm glad I went with my other friends to see her because sadly she died in, I think, February. But um, she's just one of those people that you know I couldn't explain what she did – but she did it. And Jane Grote was um, a little different, but a little different than, different than Mrs. Emelson. Um, Jane was her own person, so she didn't... I never got the sense she was... Not that Mrs. Emelson was trying to gather students around herself. It just happened naturally, organically. Uh, Mrs. Grote was, just knew who she was, and I admired that. I always admire that in people, if you know who you are. If you don't... I'm less enamored, but um, she just was very powerful and thought. I mean, I still remember one thing she said to the class. It had probably little to do with – it was in the psych class, but it probably had little to do with anything we were talking about. But someone asked about death and said, um, you know, are you afraid of death, Mrs. Grote, or something like that? And she just smiled and said, I think it's going to be a great adventure. And she wore pantsuits in the 70s and 80s, and she always wore an echo scarf of some sort and wore big glasses and would not brook any disobedience and did not like whistling. So so I was on the paper, and she was the faculty member who ran the paper, and we had a – I don't know. I don't know it was a study hall or what it was, but I came wandering in to the room, her classroom, where we did the paper stuff. And it was like probably before lunchtime on a Tuesday or something. And I was whistling. And I'm not a whistler. Um, Not anymore. No, I really wasn't even then. I don't know why I was whistling. And she sat up at the front of the room, this very small red-haired woman behind this giant desk. And my friends were sitting there. And I was coming in. I was whistling. And they all looked at me like with their eyes wide open. And I looked up at the front of the room. And Mrs. Grote's head slowly came up like an angry turtle. 
And she looked out and she said, who did that? And everyone looked at me and she asked one more time, who was whistling? And I finally confessed and said, I was Mrs. Grote. And she said, Dana, don't ever do that again. And I said, I won't, Mrs. Grote. (laughs) (laughs) So I had interrupted you (laughs) on your timeline. How did you know that you were, how did you, how were you so certain that you were going to be a psych major at Carnegie Mellon? Because I just decide stuff and do it. But, okay, but. (laughs) It's not a good, it's not a good way to be. Right before the decision, how did, uh. I mean, what was the tipping point? I just decided that the discussions of, well, what really was the tipping point was in Mrs. Grote's class. And I'm not attributing this to her. I'm attributing it actually to that bad book. Uh, it did at least a reasonable job of, of covering um, the, um, the Ash conformity studies. Okay. And uh, I, I loved those. And then, of course, that takes you willy-nilly to the Milgram experiment. And then finally you end up with Zimbardo. And related stuff, and um, that that was to me that was fascinating. I'd never heard of it, and so um, I just thought, all right, I'll be a I'll be a psychologist. And then I didn't discover. I mean, I guess I we probably said it was social psychology in high school, but I didn't really know what that right. meant. And then um, I just decided that I was going to do that. So it didn't matter where I went. That's what I was going to study. Right. Um, so was, go ahead. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, four years, and then UVA. How does that decision get made? Well, um, I started looking around at all sorts of different graduate programs. And like some students, they look for people to work with that, that they think uh-huh. will be worth working with or will want to work with them or will they have their work on a problem they liked. So I had taken classes at Carnegie Mellon with Susan Fisk, social cognition classes, and um, – I'm taking a lot of cognitive psychology because that's what then CMU was known for, and and, uh, and and social psychology with Margaret Clark and personality with Mike Shire, and um, in Fisk's class we read the Nisbet and Ross um, uh, human inference strategies of social judgment that is a classic book I think, and I read a lot about the Nisbet and Wilson studies and. Uh, I was too shy to apply uh, apply to Michigan. Uh, I didn't think I'd get in, and so. But Tim Wilson was at Virginia, so I applied there, and I applied a couple other places, uh, several. Actually, I applied to eleven places, uh, but <laughs> but uh, I decided. You know, I looked at. I don't want to name the other places because they were fine places, but for various reasons, I chose not to go. Okay. Um, perhaps in some cases for you know late adolescent dumb reasons, um, but. Uh, but I did learn you should never apply to a place you don't want to live. That's my advice to my students. If you don't want to live in Tierra del Fuego, don't apply. So, um, so anyway, uh, so I ended up um, looking over my spring break at three graduate programs, and UVA was one of them, and I just thought it was the best fit, and uh, went. And, you know, had a – I also didn't want to uh, – I my parents, God bless them, wanted me to stay in Pittsburgh, and I had applied to the University of Pittsburgh, and they're wonderful people in the social area there. And they really wanted me to come there, but I sort of thought that it would be arrested development for me, not that I don't love Pittsburgh, I do, but there was so much connection between Pitt and Carnegie Mellon, I thought, it'll just be like I never left, and also I'll still feel in thrall to these figures mm-hmm. um, that I admire so much that it might be smarter t- for me um, to meet new people. And have a different experience. And I had already been to UVA visiting friends once or twice. So, um, Did you always think you'd be back eventually to Pennsylvania? No, I figure that's God laughing at me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, I had no, I, I mean, no disrespect to my home state, but no, that was not in the plan. But how often do our plans not work out? But I really like where I am now. No, I really do like, I like where I am now. Uh, uh, but it was not in the plan at all. So you get your PhD, mm-hmm. and what's next after that? The job market is not very good. Um, I apply to a bunch of places. I have a handful of um, um, campus visits. I'm not going to say where, um, but uh, one very unusual place and one 
very good uni- small smallish university, but the teaching load was huge, and I would not have been able to have graduate students. And the teaching load was four four. I wouldn't have had graduate students, and the cost of living was astronomical, and I could not have afforded to live there on that salary. So that ruled, ruled that out. And then you know, uh, Moravian College, where I am, came along, and I interviewed and went there and thought, well, this is really small. I'll stay a year or two. Uh, but then you make friends, um, you like the community, you have children, yep. and then suddenly, and, and it is the case, you know, I think one thing that, that oftentimes academics overlook is the importance of the community. I think it's possible to um, be at a place and not like it very much, but if they're giving you the resources you want, you can live with it. However, I think it's probably a better solution if you like the people where you are and that you're doing interesting things. And I'm someone that I don't like doing the same thing over and over. And Moravian has, you know, over the years given me opportunities to do different things. And so how long have you been at Moravian? Uh, 30, this might be my 31st or 32nd year or something like that. How and did that happen? Stayed too long at the fair. <laughs> what do you, what do you teach there typically? Uh, right now, I'm department chair, so I teach a 2-2 load. Uh, so I usually teach um, personality. I haven't taught social in about two years because we have a new colleague who's much better at it than I am, uh, Dee Linda Heilmeyer, and she's doing a great job, but I'll get back in there. Um, I teach uh, uh, history and systems when I can. That doesn't That rotates through less frequently. I teach a seminar usually, and I sometimes do positive psychology. I sometimes do a seminar on the social psychology of disability. Um, And I teach human adjustment. I usually teach human adjustment every semester. That's our – that that is the course that we make available to students for general education. And that's one I love to teach because it's um, – it is is aimed at – um, mostly freshmen and sophomores who desperately need some insights into what not to do in their lives, uh, as well as what to do. Um, and you probably got a pretty good book choice for that one. Well, too. I do. I have a good book choice for that. But it's also fun to teach because um, some days I never, I don't know what I'm going to say, and then we just have a discussion because the topics are so rich and interesting. I mean, who doesn't love to talk about stress? Uh, so, hold on, hold on. You've been teaching that course. You could say you wrote the book on it. And you go into a classroom without a plan. No, no, I have I have notes, but um, uh, you know, I know it's a I know it's a bad day if I have sort of slavishly gone through my outline. I know it's a good day if you know suddenly we're off to the races with something that's on top on top. Of course, I don't of course. mean like a, a tangent. But I'm trying to get at uh, at what point in your career did you say it's okay to oh. to not have this plan? <sighs> I think I quit being. Um, a completist, uh, probably right before tenure, I realized it was foolhardy because you can't do it. You can't do everything. And but I really was, you know. And I, I think the worst the worst situation is if you're trying to do that at, when you're teaching intro. Um, but I used to be a completist, and then I stopped that. And I, you know, and I used to be. I have to cover every topic and at least the main heads in the in the in the text. And I don't do that anymore. And haven't you experienced that? Over your career, you teach less and less? Yeah, I do. Right, right. Yeah, That's I do. almost I, everyone I talk yeah, to, that's the way yeah. it is. And, you know, I used to worry that I was getting, you know, lazy, and uh, but that's not what it is. It's that you, you, you know yourself better, right. and you know what your students need better, and you know what things they should leave the class with, as opposed to everything, because, of course, they're not going to remember everything. So I, so I, I want to switch a little bit. I... So, and you're going to think that I don't mean this, and I really do, and I mean it sincerely. Dana. You make me cry? <laughs> uh, you, you haven't made me cry in a long, long time. I promise you that. You are one of my favorite writers, and I truly mean that huh. sincerely. You and Susan Nolan are actually my two favorite writers, and I mean that. I, will you talk a little bit about how did you become this prolific writer what what's your what what's your writing system or style or do you write in the morning? Do you write a certain sure. number of pages per day? And you are prolific. How, where did that come from? Is that how did, well? How does that um, happen? Uh, you know, I I wrote. I learned to write. I learned to work. I'm not going to say write. Let's do that. Yeah. I, I learned to work in the broadest sense academically at Carnegie Mellon 
Um, CMU is, unless it's changed, and I doubt it has, CMU is not the place for everyone. Um, it's students who go there are usually all about the work. Students who leave there don't leave because they don't have the ability. They leave because what is being done at CMU is not what they want to do, or um, they just don't like the work. I mean, the uh, you know, the it's 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 sort of half joke, but it's true. When um, one of one, uh, one of the one of the slogans, or slogan's not really the right word, but it's not the official motto of the school. It's really the it's actually the motto of the Carnegie Institute of Technology, which is one of the colleges at Carnegie Mellon, and I certainly wasn't in that. Uh, I was in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, which is now the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Anyway, um, uh, Andrew Carnegie said, "My heart is in the work," and that may be my, my epitaph. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I really learned to work there, and writing was part of that. But mm -hmm. I wasn't a good writer at CMU. I was a, an adequate writer. Um, I learned. APA style uh, there um, and was good at it. Not great, but good at it. Not that I think that's the be all end all. But I, in terms of like other types of writing, I didn't really learn that till actually after graduate school because you're still sort of, mm -hmm. you know, copying models in a sense. Um, but when I got to Moravian and then needed to start to publish, um, I actually learned to write from based on Charles Brewer's. Um, rather uh, red pen letters. So the first little piece I wrote, which was very short, it was a little piece in faculty forum. And I'm not embarrassed to say this. I was back then. But I think it went through six iterations. And this was in the days when there was no electronic communication. It was all through the mail. Yeah, I wish I had some of those too. And uh, I, I used I to have them. I think they're long gone. But, you know, and Charles really taught me not to be a lazy writer uh, by example. And then, you know, I, I believe, you know, it's a cliche, but writing is a muscle. The more you do it, you know, the stronger you are. And so I just – and I also think the more you write, the better your writing becomes. And, and also at the same time I was starting to publish, um, we had a, 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 a several, several major curricular changes at, at Moravian and a lot were writing focused. And so I learned to teach writing. And when you learn to teach writing, you, you know, it should rub off on you. Um, and I thought about it a lot more. And then I just gradually developed a routine. So my routine is I write mostly in the morning if I can, uh, unless it's like a memorandum or something um, or an email. Um, I don't have any – I mean I probably don't write for more than two or three hours in the morning. I don't do a page thing. Like I know some – Dave Myers I think does – his rule is three pages a day. I don't think that way. Sometimes it's three pages. Sometimes it's three paragraphs. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's more. So I just do that and also I am a constant reviser. So um, – and I learned this. I can't – I, I want to give credit where credit's due but I can't remember what – what person who wrote about writing. I want to say it was Christopher Peterson, but I may be wrong. Anyway, um, I, 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 I mock out a paper. By that I mean I make a title page, an abstract page, you know, all that stuff, and I start filling it. And, and that's also a way to get into a manuscript so you're not frightened because a lot of people are scared by the blank page. By the way, I remember you presenting that. You presented that model at an APA conference in Division Two one one year. And I have used that for quite some time with my students. Yeah. It's how to get them started on their APA manuscript, and all of a sudden they have a seven-page paper right. because they have mock, mocked out yeah. their title page, their abstract. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a trick. Yeah. Uh, like someone during graduate school told me that um, when she would write um, – she would use different colored paper because if it wasn't white, it was okay. And that's how hmm. she'd do her first drafts. I haven't done that, but the yeah. idea is similar. But um, so I just, but I start from the first line of whatever I've written the day before. Actually, the first line of the paper, however long it is, whether it's twelve pages or two, and I revi I go through every line and see if it needs to be revised. And if you do that after like the twentieth twentieth time, um, you know the words make sense and there should be flow and structure. And if not, then you change it. And so, uh, you know, and when you do, at least in my experience, when I do that, um, the paper almost writes itself. So, 
Are you sketching anything out with uh, paper and a nice fountain pen before you go to your Mac? That's when I, I actually, I still like to print. I'm still pretty old-fashioned. If I can, I print out a hard copy and then then use a fountain pen to edit. Okay. But um, but I've actually, I've finally gotten around to editing online. I can do that or on the screen. But for a long time, I wouldn't do that. And for years, I would write longhand and then type it in. I no longer do that. But... For a long time, I was afraid not to do that, that I would lose the touch. But So I have a risky question. Uh-huh. Uh, and and we might edit it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Please. Here, this is where it gets fun. Uh, my question is, you mentioned something. You said the paper almost writes itself. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you think about ideas? And how do you think about... Um, Obviously, you have all these mechanisms in place that make it easier for you to express what your thoughts are or whatever. But when you say that 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 ideas express themselves, do you do you is is that any is there any kind of faith you have in the ideas that they will come? Because some you talked about writer's block too a little bit that sometimes people just need to start and get over the fear of it. Well, so far, I've, I mean, I, I, you know, there's only been a few cases where I'm stuck on something, and that usually means I shouldn't have accepted the assignment. Um, uh, it means I'm not interested in it, or I really don't know anything about it, and I you know, can't seem to figure out how to do it. But, but for the most part, I just sort of, I mean, I, uh, I like to write, and I find it, you know, maybe it's the, maybe it's Chick Sent Me High's Flow Experience, I don't know. Um, I'm never, I'm never uncomfortable, and I also like do little writing exercises, or I call them writing exercises. So, you know, I write a blog not because I, I probably shouldn't say this, but not because I need to write a blog, but because I like to see what I can bang out in 400 or 500 words. Or, I do book reviews for Choice Magazine because they're 190 word exercises, and I see how I can describe a whole book in 190 words. So. Are your at this point in your career is writing for you just fun? Yeah, yeah. I and if it, it I wasn't, I would do it all the time. I would, I would. If if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't do it. But I really enjoy doing it. And so, when it's not fun, or when you're stuck, I'm hearing you say there's something wrong in. Or I I probably shouldn't have. I shouldn't have. I shouldn't. I I probably didn't think through why I was doing this. Like, was it something I knew about? Was it something I cared about? Was it something I could really make a contribution to in the sense of looking at something differently or adding something that had been ignored? Um, when it doesn't work so well, or it re- or I haven't I haven't read the relevant literature, or, and then sometimes I think, oh, God, so then I try to find the relevant literature, and then I can't find it, and then it's bad. <laughs> so are you looking for any new writing exercises? Not right now. Not that I know. Because I have one idea for you. (laughs) Writing in short 140 character snippets. Oh, no. No. (laughs) I've avoided that like the plague. Uh, I think that's uh, no. No. And and not because I don't think it couldn't be that thing. It's because once it's out there, you can't take it back. And, and Once you've seen, published a book, you can't take it back either. There, other people have looked at it, and I've you know gone over it a million times. But no, I think Twitter. Uh, I'm I still look look coldly at Twitter. Who looks at your Psychology Today blog before you post it? Nobody. So, well, but you know you can't. It's different. Uh, because I, I think I agree. Tw- Twitter is, I agree Twitter is in the moment. And, I agree it's different. And I think yes. we've seen enough how people have gotten into trouble or caused trouble. But I think someone like you posting on Twitter yeah. with your expertise in areas could be really valuable. Well, I'm we'll just going to say I'll, that. I'll, I'll give it some thought. But well, I don't. But I, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't really need more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think you need to give it any thought. I'm just talking about as a writing well, exercise. Well, as a writing exercise, 140 characters is incredibly yeah, limiting. It is very limiting. Um, yeah. So, so so we probably just have a couple minutes I left, Eric, and right. and I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to hit with Dana. I mean, this has been really great. Th- this is th- this is part one because there's so many things I would love to talk to you about. <laughs> We've always known we'd have repeat guests. Um, <laughs> if, if I if let let me let me scan the data banks here because we've had, you know, um, Dana vi- Dana and I have had so many dinners and conversations over the years. Uh, a lot of them private that I'm not going to recap here. Uh, well, we we I, know about each other's children and lives, and that's not for conversations here. Um, 
I you know, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to. This is this will be out in probably end of end of October or something. Yeah, end and of by October, that early November, by that time, uh, it'll be public knowledge what's going on with the journal, right? I yeah, it'll be. It, it is now. I don't think. Yeah. it's been, I don't think it's been. I don't know what APA is planning I, on doing I, something. Yeah, I think it. I think it's. I, I think it's announceable. So um, Regan Goering and I were the founding uh, co-editors of um, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Psychology, a great honor for us. Uh, another following uh, subsequent great honor will be Dr. Dana Dunn, will be the next editor of Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in Psychology. Oh, and it, it is a great honor. And so, uh, and, the, and, the, and the best news is that the hard work's already been done by you and Regan. <laughs> well, um, there there was some uh, there was some work getting it up and running, but you know the the actually to be honest with you, it the hard work is going to be I got to split the workload uh, of processing manuscripts, and you're not going to be splitting the workload with anybody. Well. Or are you? Well, I the, don't know. Well, the 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 at least uh, the the people I talked to in the uh, publications office said that if I wanted to appoint associate editors, that oh, would be possible. Very good, so because I, that was not an option for us. So I, I good think for you. I, I, well, I'm thinking about it. I need to yeah, make yeah. sure that that's a fair thing to do. Yeah. So Forever. what's this like to walk into, Dana? Um, it's exciting. Um, you know, I gave it a lot of thought. Someone, some kind, sweet person nominated me without my knowledge. And when I was contacted by the search committee, I, I probably thought about it for a week or two, which is a long time for me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, um, you know, put in the application materials and then tried not to think about it. And then lo and behold, I heard and, and, uh, and got the brass ring and, uh, and then I thought about it again for about a week. Like, do I did I really want to take on this responsibility at this point? But um, I mean, I did it for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's uh, it's a way to give back. And sometimes I don't think I'm giving back enough, so uh, I have to give back. And this is a good way to do it. It's a public giving back. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow up on that when Dana's done with this thought. Uh, I think you know, I think it it, it will be good for my institution. Uh, my provost Cynthia Caso was an, extremely supportive about it. And said, you know, encouraged me to do it. And uh, you know, I think we all want um, the scholarship of teaching and learning journal to succeed. Uh, and so I want to be a part of that. And it's nice that we now have, you know, several high quality teaching and pedagogy journals in psychology available. So teaching of psychology, STL. Um, uh, psychology, learning, and teaching. So I think all of the all this is to the good because it shows that you know education in our discipline matters a great deal. And I know I, I'm sounding like a uh, an up with people kind of person, but I I do believe that's important. So so yes, I'm very excited. I'm a little nervous, but the good news is I have another six months before I need to start agonizing. So. Did Did you have to give up something in like? in the next couple of years in order to do this? Did you have to go through that? Um, I am on the board, the editorial board of, of a handful of journals, and I have told them that I would like to be released because my attention needs to go to this, although I am staying on on rehabilitation psychology. Uh, I'm a consulting editor there, and that's important to me. So, But other than that, I have been turning down other opportunities because it's just – you know, it's too much. And I have other things I want to do, too, continue so, to do. I am going to follow up on one thing about the <laughs> – I'm, I'm sorry, my friend. So so this notion of I haven't been giving back enough, you are, of course, entitled to your opinion. And I will respectfully allow you to believe in that. There's this little thing that got founded by um, STP. It's called Best Practices. It's now called the Annual Conference on Teaching. And for about the first 11 years of Best Practices – uh, there was a book that came out of Best Practices, and it was an edited volume, and there had to be an editor. And uh, the editor uh, made an agreement to donate all the royalties from the edited volume of STP. I know. What was I thinking? To And so the editor of all of those volumes... Dana S. Dunn. With with often others, but often yes. others, but Dana was the lead editor, which meant that he did most of the work because he was the lead but and I, first but I benefited editor. from that. 
Yeah, I know. You built that home, didn't you, off of those royalties from those no, edited books? No, but I benefited in the sense that I really learned how to do books. And I learned to work with, well, I, I mean, I worked with a lot of great people. And don't you think each and, of those things was giving back? Yeah, but there's a lot of, there was a lot of, you know, ego involvement as well. And I consider that not giving back. That's benefiting. So, so wait, so, so really? So to give back, I, there can't be any ego benefit on well, my part? I, I, I think, I, I think probably my participation was more studied than that. <laughs> Well, I think it's a stage, a career stage yeah. thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I yeah. could not do it. <laughs> so that's not giving back. That's taking. <laughs> well, wait. If it has to be pure, if it has to be pure, then there's no way to ever truly give back. Yeah, yeah. I learned that in philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> is well, this Kant well, but, or Nietzsche or no, which one I is this? I can't remember, but uh, but no, but let's think about it. I mean, I think I think in the case of STL, it's it's you know I'm, I'm I. I, I I, I wouldn't necessarily need to do this at this stage in the game, but I want right. to do it, right. and I'm not necessarily doing it for for glory, although that won't be bad. But um, <laughs> I'm doing it because, you know, I, I really, I mean, I want to see I this know. continue to succeed, and I'm, and I've always I've always wanted to be the, an editor of an APA journal. So I'm there, going, there, 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 that's selfish. I'm going to gently just. Dis- I'm all I'm going to say is that I think you've given back to STP and psychology more than most people ever will. Oh, and, please. And I am entitled to my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for sitting down with Dana, us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for my the pleasure. time. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm-hmm.